afternoon, everyone, and thanks for sticking with us through a few technical difficulties we were having. Welcome to the Washington Medical Commission webinar series. Today, we're going to look at the 2021 updates for opioid prescribing and monitoring. So today, we're honored to have Dr. Alden Roberts and Dr. Greg Terman joining us. Before I turn the webinar over, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, so look for the question box on your webinar portal. We will do our best to address your questions toward the end of the presentation. We hope that you do not have any technical difficulties, but if you do, look for the help button on the webinar portal to get your issue worked out. We are recording this webinar, and the on-demand version and the slide deck will be available on our website within the next few days. Please feel free to share these resources with your colleagues. We want our learning events to be as interactive as possible, so please feel free to use our social media platforms to share what you have learned and keep the conversation going. This webinar is accredited for one hour of Category 1 CME by the Federation of State Medical Boards. If you're watching this in a group setting, please make sure you register for the webinar and complete the evaluation as an individual to receive CME credit. A link to the post-webinar evaluation will be emailed to you after the presentation. Please complete this evaluation within the next two weeks to receive CME credit. The evaluation link will also be available on the webinar webpage. This webinar was not funded by any commercial entity. The speaker, course director, and planners at the Federation of State Medical Boards and the Washington Medical Commission have nothing to disclose. The objectives for today are to identify the types of pain governed by these rules, identify the exclusions in the rule, understand the additional CME requirements, understand, prescription, understand the prescription monitoring program, and answer questions about incorporating the changes into your daily practice. We will also be addressing some specific questions and concerns we've received ahead of time, including requirements for documentation, co-prescribing, and update on tapering recommendations and best practices when interacting with a new patient. At the end of our short presentation, there will be an extended Q&A period to answer your general questions and um, address any other concerns. Now, with all of that out of the way, I will turn it over to Dr. Roberts. Hi, everybody, and thanks for being here this afternoon, and thanks for waiting through the delays that we had in technical difficulties. Uh, I'm Dr. Alden Roberts. My background is in general surgery, and I am a past chair of the Washington Medical Commission. I was a member of the Opioid Prescribing and Monitoring Joint Task Force, uh, which was tasked by the legislature to come up with these rules, and I was co-chair of the Com Washington Medical Commission Opioid Rules Committee, and those are the two committees that actually develop the rules that we have. Uh, thanks for having me here today. In 2017, the legislature passed uh, in Gross Substitute House Bill 1427, which basically said that there was a prescribing problem in this country that aggravates uh, the opioid problem. They were correct, and they charged the prescribing entities to fix it. And to their credit, they mostly allowed practitioners to do so rather than trying to fix it themselves. They did not say that the opioid epidemic was because of bad doctors or caused by bad prescribing. That statement would have been patently incorrect. They did, however, have some expectations, which if we had not addressed, they most certainly would have. The process for developing these rules chosen by the Department of Health brought together all of the prescribing entities, including the Washington Medical Commission, the Osteopathic Board, the Nursing Commission, the Dental Board, and the Podiatric Board, as the Opioid Prescribing and Monitoring Task Force. We were presented a straw man structure for the rules and then tried to modify that straw man um, in order to make something that would be consistent across all of the prescribing entities. As the process moved forward, the Medical Commission Opioid Rules Committee also met. We discussed and modified what was happening at the Joint Task Force, and we brought back suggestions for improvement. Both groups had considerable input from pain specialists, AMDG, or the Agency Medical Directors Group, BRE collaborative members, as well as local practitioners, the Washington Medical, uh, Washington State Medical Association, patients who had chronic pain, and the public. Next slide, please. Uh, 
this slide um, sort of tells what the continuing medical education uh, requirements will be. These new rules, uh, the CME requirements are minimal. You need to complete one hour regarding best practices as it relates to the prescribing of opioids prior to your next CME reporting, and this webinar counts as that hour. If you prescribe long-acting opioids, the CME requirements that were put forth in the rules from 2012 still apply. You must have a one-time CME of at least four hours related to that topic, and you must be familiar with the risks of long-acting opioids and the use of these medications and be prepared to conduct the necessary careful monitoring that's associated with that. Next slide. The new rules cover the following phases of pain management, acute non-operative non pain, acute perioperative pain, subacute pain, and chronic pain. Exclusions from the rules include treatment of patients with cancer-related pain, the provision of palliative care, hospice care, or other end-of-life care, the treatment of inpatient hospital patients, soon to include patients in extended care facilities, and the provision of procedural medications. The objectives of these rules was to increase safety in prescribing practices, to engage prescribers and medical professionals in the prevention of opioid dependency, improve the quality of life for those patients who suffer from pain, as well as to reduce the morbidity, mortality, and costs associated with untreated or inappropriately treated pain, and to control patient's pain while effectively addressing the other aspects of a patient's functional capacity. One of the big problems in developing rules of this type is that it is really difficult to work on a pain management process in which best practice isn't the goal. Regulatory bodies cannot make rules that are designed to achieve best practice because not everybody agrees on what best practice looks like, because not every patient follows the pathways from which best practice are derived, and because best practice changes with new information. So instead, the rules are designed to assess what is minimally acceptable practice, which isn't easy because there is no body of literature on what constitutes minimally acceptable practice. For best practices, providers are referred to the AMDG, CDC, Bree Collaborative, or other best practice websites. The majority of what is new in these rules revolves around three areas, registration and use of the physician uh, prescription monitoring program, prescribing rules for the transitions between the phases of pain, including acute pain and subacute pain, and between subacute pain and chronic pain. And there are some minor revisions in the 2012 rules for chronic pain that brings them up to date with current practices. Next slide. In terms of documentation, the majority of documentation requirements are included on this slide. The commission recognizes that rules can't apply equally to all situations. And in most instances, the rules specifically indicate that adequate documentation as to why a course of action was chosen and how it is being monitored provides considerable protection when one is deviating from these rules. Learn to treat pain well as it relates to your patients and your specialty. Reassessment of treatment efficacy and appropriate documentation are required when patients transition between the phases of pain. It is really easy for an operative patient or from an injured patient to continue to get refills of opioids for a much longer time period than intended, and safety checks are usually neglected for these patients. Treatment choices, benefits, and risks change as patients transition from acute pain to subacute pain and from subacute pain to chronic pain. Reassessment and documentation as described in this slide is required when patients make these transitions. The purpose of these rules is to provide appropriate treatment of pain. This includes non-treatment. I'm sorry, the purpose of these rules is to avoid inappropriate treatment of pain. This includes non-treatment, under-treatment, over-treatment, and the continued use of ineffective treatments. Fear of these rules or disciplinary action should not be used as an excuse not to manage pain. The Medical Commission has no interest in disciplining good physicians who are trying to do a good job. But as with any other disease process, providers may need to justify and document why they are managing things the way they are. Next slide, and Dr. Terman. I apologize for the camera being out, um, but 
uh, hopefully we can continue. Um, so even the earliest studies of prescription opioid fatalities in the U.S. reported more than uh, two thirds of decedent um, had ingested multiple contributory substances, um, largely alcohol and its sedatives with the opioids. Um, nonetheless, from 2000 to 2014, the estimated prevalence of concurrent prescribing of benzodiazepines and opioids increased by nearly 250%. Um, next slide. As a result, uh, the prescribing rules uh, uh, look unfavorably with uh, of co-prescribing opioids and benzodiazepines and other sedatives, um, including the barbiturates, uh, soma uh, sedatives, and, and non-benzodiazepine hypnotics like the Z drugs. Uh, next slide. A more favorably co-prescription uh, is naloxone uh, with opioids. And in particular, in high-risk patients, um, the uh, rules say to uh, prescribe naloxone or at least confirm that a naloxone prescription has already been given in current uh, to high-risk patients. Now, high-risk is defined in the rules as uh, patients with opioid-induced morbidity or mortality, um, largely uh, opioid use disorder or opioid uh, overdose. Um, patients that have polypharmacy, uh, that have medical and behavioral comorbidities, current substance use disorder or abuse, aberrant behaviors, dose uh, high doses of opioids, or the use of any concurrent central nervous system depressant, as we were just talking about. Next slide. Prescription monitoring programs, as Dr. Roberts was mentioning, um, were featured in the rules 2019. Um, if you prescribe Schedule II opioids, uh, you must register or have access uh, to the PMP. Um, PMP uh, queries um, are first refill or renewal of an opioid prescription, uh, pain transition between treatment phases, uh, as Dr. Roberts was talking about, from acute to subacute or subacute to chronic, um, providing episodic care to a patient who you know to be receiving opioids for chronic pain, and periodically uh, based on the patient's risk level, that is uh, annually for low risk or biannually for moderate risk or quarterly for high risk patients. Next, patient, next uh, slide, please. Now you can delegate the PMP queries uh, to other DOH licensed professionals um, but any pertinent concerns discovered in the PMP must be documented in the patient record. Um, coming up uh, is likely to be uh, a mandatory um, PMP uh, integration uh, with the EMR uh, in the state. Uh, already with the 2019 uh, laws, uh, rules, um, the, uh, um, any, if you already have a, uh, EMR that is integrated with the PMP, you must perform PMP queries every time you prescribe an opioid or a sedative that we just talked about in the co-prescribing rule. Uh, next slide, please. One of the issues discussed throughout the rulemaking had to do with caring for patients with chronic pain who were new to a provider. Many patients have been stable on their opioid treatment for years with no or minimal dose escalation. The new rules try and encourage providers 
to get to know such patients before starting over with their own treatment plans. The rules say it is normally appropriate to maintain the current opioid doses initially. Um, treatment of a new high dose chronic pain patient is exempt for the mandatory consultation requirement if the dosage in excess of 120 MED is under an established written agreement, if the dose is stable and non-escalating, if the patient has a history of compliance with treatment plans, um, there's documented pain control with the opioids, and uh, uh, but this exemption applies only to the first three months of care. Uh, next slide. On the other hand, over time, tapering is likely to be a part of the treatment plan. How else is one going to identify the least effective dose called for in the, in the rules and in the CDC guidelines? Um, so uh, over time, gradual dose adjustments, uh, tapering should be considered. Um, and in the rules that mirror the CDC guidelines in some ways, uh, you should consider tapering um, or referral for substance use disorder consultation when there is a request by the patient, a, de a deterioration in patient pain or function, non-compliance with written agreement, unauthorized dose escalation, a severe adverse event like an overdose, evidence of misuse, abuse, substance use disorder, or diversion, and an escalation of opioid dose, which produces no improvement in pain or function, uh, suggesting that other treatment modalities are indicated. A next slide, please. Now, since the passing of the rules, uh, this tapering has um, become uh, concerning. Uh, both the FDA, CDC, and the Washington Medical Commission in uh, clarification of the rules in, in late 2019 um, have, uh, have given this general sort of, of guidance uh, of their concern. Healthcare professionals should not abruptly discontinue opioids in a patient who is physically dependent. When you and your patient have agreed to taper the dose of opioid analgesic, consider a variety of factors, including the dose of the drug, the duration of treatment, type of pain being treated, and the physical and psychological attributes of the patient. No standard opioid tapering schedule exists that is suitable for all patients. Create a patient-specific plan to gradually taper the dose of the opioid and ensure ongoing monitoring and support as needed to avoid serious withdrawal symptoms, worsening the patient's pain or psychological distress. Now, since the since even these uh, um, statements by FDA, CDC, and, and Washington Medical Commission, um, best practice guidelines on tapering from both BRI and HHS. Uh, federally have been um, published. And um, at the end, there's a uh, reference to, to both of those documents. Uh, next slide. In fact, the CDC has, uh, this has uh, reiterated uh, what Dr. Roberts already said about the rules, that their guidelines is not intended to deny any patients who suffer with chronic pain from opioid therapy as an option for pain management. Rather, the guideline is intended to ensure that clinicians and patients consider all safe and effective treatment options for patients. CDC encourages physicians to continue to use their clinical judgment and base treatment on what they know about their patients, including the use of opioids, if determined to be the best course of treatment. Next slide. So I hope everyone will thank, you know, give me a virtual thank you for, for 
for Dr. Sherman and Dr. Roberts and giving that great presentation. Um, as uh, Please use the questions function to ask your questions and I can read those aloud. Alternatively, you can also raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, so while those questions are coming in, I thought we would go over some frequently asked questions, but we did have a question um, from the presentation that maybe we could go over now. And that is, what is defined as integrated within EMR, presumably an active link, or is it pre-population of the PMP search fields within with demographics? Okay, um, so integrated means that you have a link to the PMP information. Uh, it usually goes through the Health Information Exchange, um, uh, EMR like uh, Epic. Uh, it's actually a kind of a one-click, um, and it will uh, populate the uh, the PMP information into the electronic medical record. Um, so that's what integration means: is that instead of going directly to the PMP website, you can get that information um, directly without getting out of your uh, electronic uh, medical record. Yeah. So let's go over some FAQs. So will these rules impact all types of pain management? So the answer to that is no. The rules don't apply when you're treating patients that have cancer-related pain, when you're providing palliative care, hospice care, or end-of-life care, um, caring for inpatient hospitals or procedural pre-medications. In addition, for extended care facilities, we don't consider we consider those to be, um, for the most part, excluded. There are some minor exceptions to that, but basically, you can't practice bad medicine, and it doesn't matter whether it's related to opioid care or if it's related to diabetic care. You need to do what's right, and and um, for the most part, the things that are excluded are excluded for valid reasons. And do MDs and PAs have to register with the PMP? So if um, if you prescribe uh, Schedule II opioids uh, in, in the state of Washington, you must register with the PMP or uh, demonstrate proof of access to the program. So for instance, if you uh, do have an integrated uh, PMP. Um, some people have, um, have, or the rules say that you can, uh, that that is uh, sufficient, uh, that you can uh, get that information through the electronic health record. I still recommend um, registering um, because uh, there are times when um, going directly to the PMP uh, can be useful. Um, the uh, um, some electronic health record or the H, the uh, HIE information um, is often uh, lags a little bit behind um, the actual PMP, um, and and uh, and also um, the PMP has better ability to um, be certain that the person in front of you um, is the name that you're getting. Um, so for instance, uh, if you're taking care of uh, Bob Jones, um, it's, it's nice to know that that Bob Jones at his address is, uh, is different um, than the Robert Jones at a different address. Um, the HIE sometimes, or that they're the same person uh, who's now changed uh, addresses, the uh, HIE may not be able to catch uh, that those people are the same or different, whereas the PMP uses um, some uh, uh, filtering technology to allow uh, checking to uh, identify that both of those 
people are the same. That's much less important for someone who's taking care of a patient uh, chronically. You, you, this is not a new patient for you. Um, you don't really need to check to see if that person is the person you've been prescribing to for the last uh, several months. So when should I check the data in the PMP? Well, the 2019 rules say all this. Next slide, please. But as I mentioned, um, there was legislation late in 2019, Senate Bill 5380, that mandated that any group over 10 prescribers um, would have um, would have integrated EMR uh, with the PMP. Um, now that was supposed to be uh, in January of this year, um, but there's been this um, virus problem that we've had, uh, and that's delayed some things. Uh, and so at the moment. It's been delayed to September of this year. Uh, I don't have any insight into whether that might be delayed again. Uh, there are exclusions for um, um, technical or financial reasons, um, but the uh, it is mandatory that uh, that the uh, PMP and the electronic medical record. Uh, be um, be integrated, and that uh, then means that every time you write an opioid prescription um, or or those sedative, um, that you are now mandated to check the PMP. So, a big one. What is the inappropriate treatment of pain? So the rules for prescribing opioids state that in a, the inappropriate treatment of pain is a departure from standard of practice. And for the purposes of these rules, that would include non-treatment, under-treatment, over-treatment, or the continued use of ineffective treatments. And again, basically what I would say is in many, most practices, you're going to see patients who have pain, please learn to treat their pain appropriately in the same way that you would learn to treat their diabetes or hypertension appropriately and to manage it that way and document what you do, what you need to do. And that's it for our frequently asked questions. We do have um, an additional resource page here. Um, everything that Dr. Tarman and Dr. Roberts have been talking about, we've put to one handy slide for you. You can access that through the slide deck on the website. And then um, please feel free to continue to submit your questions via the question box. You can raise your hand. I do see we have a couple hands raised. Um, and so, uh, Sunday, Henry, I'm going to unmute you if you're still there. And make sure you're, you've unmuted yourself, Sunday. Okay, well, we have a written question. Um, so I'm just going to read it off. The guidelines are indicating that the PMP should be queried with every opioid prescription, but in the case of stable chronic pain, patient, a less frequent interval of evaluation is acceptable. Um, opio uh, opioid prescriptions are commonly written on a 28 to 30 day basis if three successive prescriptions are written on the same day to cover the 90 day interval between evaluation appointments. Does the PMP query need to be done every 30 days in the absence of the in-person evaluation? So. Uh, 
I mean, I'll I'll take that if if you want me to, uh, Alden. Um, so the uh, again, the rules have specific uh, times when there needs to be um, uh, PMP evaluations, and the queries are risk based in chronic. Uh, if you've passed into the chronic phase of prescribing opioids, then it depends on the risks of the patient. Now, um, since that time, um, in, uh, uh, with the mandatory integration of PMPs and, and EMRs, um, the question you're asking is now, do we have to go from risk-based to an every time I write a prescription? Uh, and, and I think that the answer is yes, every time you write a prescription. Um, and, um, and my, to be honest, uh, I think that checking the PMP, if, if we can make it easy enough, it goes beyond that. Uh, who wouldn't want to know that someone that they're seeing is on a benzodiazepine from Dr. X and a um, an opiate from Dr. Y, uh, even if they're treating them for uh, their blood pressure that seems to be out of control at the moment? Um, I, I think it's reasonable to know what patients are, are taking. Um, and we're not very good at just looking at patients and telling uh, what they're taking. Um, so that's, that's my two cents in terms of best practice. Uh, what the rules, uh, as I say, once, once things are mandatory, uh, there's going to be a uh, increase in in the requirements. So I think to a certain extent, some of what that question brings forward is how well do you know the folks that you're taking care of because you're you're writing a prescription for um, Three months. You're writing prescriptions for three months time period, and if this is a stable patient who hasn't been to a lot of other physicians and who isn't isn't changing their medications with any significant frequency. Uh, I think Greg is right. Ideally, it would be best to to look and see whether or not they're getting medications from somebody else as a safety precaution. But it, I do recognize the difficulty with that because there's nothing bringing these patients to your attention. Um, Greg, any thoughts on that? Uh, well, so if you write them all at, uh, if you write them all at the same uh, time, then I think that the rules say uh, that you, you check it then. Uh, the pharmacists will check it every time uh, that they fill the prescription. So if you've written three um, prescriptions at one time and you've you've dated them uh, down the road, the 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 pharmacist will um, check the prescription when they are dispensing, um, and they will enter what they're dispensing into the PMP. Um, so um, again, uh, I, I'm. I don't have anything more to say. Uh, uh, just say the, the same thing over and over, um, which is checking the PMP um, when you when you check when you write a prescription. And could you say a bit about the consultation requirements and the difficulty regarding the availability of specialty consultation? Uh, yes, so um, the, uh, the specialty um, are, are actually fairly wide ranging. Uh, the uh, AMDG guidelines 
uh, which were then turned into the 2012 uh, rules. Um, the thing that took the longest for us to come up with the AMDG guidelines was trying to figure out who is um, a pain specialist. Um, and and it's, you know, it's everything from uh, dental surgeons um, to uh, to any anesthesiologist uh, uh, is included in those specialists. Um, I think I think more importantly, and and what the AMDG guidelines finally kind of came down on is what's important is to get um, an opinion on whether the opioids you're prescribing are part of the solution or part of the problem. Um, and you know, them in reality, that might be just telling your uh, your partner who doesn't know anything about pain. Um, now that wouldn't fulfill the rules, um, but it's it would be a reasonable approach in terms of uh, trying to get outside help, trying to get an objective view as to is do we really want to keep going up, up, up? on this is there any evidence that this is actually helping this patient's pain or or just putting the patient at risk um and and that's really what the consultation rule was all about and and since it was published in 2006 as part or seven i think as part of the amdg guideline initial uh draft um, that's really all it was about trying to get help in that way it's now more, you know, codified because it's a rule, um, and there are um, uh, the University of Washington, for instance, has uh, uh, a telepain um, uh, approach that uh, some people have used to try and get um, help. Um, but as I said, there. There is, it's a wide ranging group of, of specialists. Um, and uh, at, at the very least, I think the University of Washington um, has a uh, opioid uh, hotline, um, for instance, run by a pharmacy in cooperation with uh, the pain uh, division here, um, where there's someone that uh, is available to take phone calls, um, and uh, and may that this I'm not as sure of may have someone in, uh, near to you um, that they could recommend to to actually see the patient. Um, and just as a bit of a shameless plug, we are actually having those folks from the opioid pain uh, consultation at UW and the telepain hotline. They're going to be giving a webinar on how to access their services, when to access. Um, they're going to be giving a CME webinar um, in on the 19th. I'll put the link to the registration into the chat if anyone's interested in learning more about how you can use UW for a consultation and all the services that they provide. And just one more, just one more thing. Sorry, Alden. Maybe you're going to say this. The other thing about the consultation rule is that you have to have tried. And, and that's uh, yeah, go ahead. That's where I was going to go, Greg. Is that you? You do need to have tried. The University of Washington resource is a great one, and um, I would encourage folks to use that web webinar if you can document that you've tried. That's we we recognize that there is a shortage of people who can provide this service. Um, but it is important that you've tried and really that you continue trying and document that you continue trying until you get the help that you need. And and, and along those lines, there are fewer and fewer people. Um, I mean, I, I am seeing people in the state who are having trouble retiring because they have people patients that they care about have been working with for many years on stable opioid uh, regimens 
that they can't find anyone that would be willing to actually take over those regiments. Um, and that's why we maybe talked a little more about these quote legacy patients uh, today than we have in other webinars. Are there any other questions that are lingering amongst our audience? I'll give a couple moments just in case anyone's typing, um, but I will put the registration link actually in the follow-up email that you'll receive um, after this presentation. Um, and again, I'll, I think, I believe it's the 19th. I can't remember off the top of my head, but please come and ask any questions you have there. Um, okay, so this question is, how many PCPs are still willing to treat chronic pain patients? idea is percentage of roughly the 6,000 primary care. I don't have that data. So. Yeah, we're, we're not going to have the information, and it's unfortunate that um, that PCPs have had to stop seeing these people. I see this more as a, these are difficult patients to take care of, and they can't be done in a short time period. It's not very cost effective to take care of these folks. The rules actually aren't that difficult. And if folk, if people wanted to take care of these folks, it would be fairly safe and easy to do so. But um, they can be difficult patients because they don't fit into a 15 minute slot. And because there is a fair amount of stuff that has to be done when you're managing these folks. It is an important thing to do though, it's a really critical service that needs to be done. Um, these patients do need to be taken care of. They need to be taken care of properly. And I think, I, I wish there was a way that we could have a systemic solution for how we're gonna get these folks taken care of. But at the present time, it seems relatively elusive. Craig? Well, so I guess you probably struck a nerve. Um, I, I would say um, that um, even if you don't prescribe opioids, uh, to say that you're not going to take care of chronic pain patients, I mean, there are more than there are more than 50 million um, high impact. That means that if the pain affects their roles, what, what, how they live their lives. Um, more than 50 million uh, high impact chronic pain patients uh, in the country. Um, uh, the pain is the most common reason people come to the doctor um, to say you're not going to take care of chronic pain is hard for me to to understand um I, I don't sorry i don't take care of high blood pressure um and i'm glad my doctor does um take care of high blood pressure so um you know i i think even if you don't treat patients with opioids um not treating chronic pain is a concern and and uh i think that the rules pretty clearly say that under treatment of chronic pain is also a problem um and um and and certainly that's how i feel i i absolutely agree i just i know that it's a problem and i know that we're seeing more and more um, primary care physicians who don't wish to manage people who have long-term pain. And it is, it is a, it's a problem. I don't really know what the solution is, but it is a problem. And I, I think it's a critical thing for folks to take care of. Heidi, you have your hand up. Um, I'm going to unmute you to see if you can ask your question. 
Don't forget to unmute yourself. It was an accident. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we don't have any other questions at this time. I'll give another couple minutes, but just in case there are any last minute hands up or um, questions while that's happening, I just want to thank you again, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Sherman for presenting this valuable information. And I really appreciate everyone participating. The presentation slides, this webinar recording, and the CME evaluation will be available on our website. Please remember to complete the evaluation. You will be emailed to receive CME credit. And with that, it looks like we don't have any other questions. So I just wanna wish everyone a wonderful week and to remember to take care of yourself. Hi, everyone.